Hey, how's it going everybody? Brad the Guitologist here. Uh, as you can see, we have uh, something pretty cool today. This is an early 1970s, I believe about a 1972, Super Lead 100. This is not a Plexi, although it's probably very close to the same exact circuit. It is not a Plexi face. Uh, so this is actually after they moved over to the uh, brushed aluminum or whatever the face became after that. But you can see here, it has the standard, you know, Marshall thing, the four input the classic ripoff of the uh, Fender Bassman. Uh, we have two channels with their own volume controls, volume one, volume two. We have treble middle bass and the omnipresent Marshall style presence control. But yeah, this should be pretty cool. Uh, if you guys want to join me in the journey of servicing this thing and getting it back up into running shape, please stick around. Today's video is sponsored by Native Sons Goods, makers of the highest quality woven guitar, bag, and camera straps you'll ever see. Native Sons straps are handmade one at a time in the USA with unparalleled love and care. Click the link in the description to check out their new expanded lineup featuring all new three inch guitar straps. And remember, when you support my sponsor, you support this channel and I sure appreciate it. Okay, so this thing, yeah, has definitely been around the block a little bit. It's got some rips and tears in the Tolex. You can see right there, it's got some tears. And most of these Marshalls that you're ever gonna find uh, will have these sorts of things. This definitely looks like the original uh, logo because it's yellowed, it's got the right amount of kind of age and contrast and I would be willing to bet the farm that that's most likely an original logo from this era, which is pretty rare. Usually these are broken. You get usually L's broken off or some combination of the letters broken off. So it'll usually end up saying something like a Marsha. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Uh, you've got a bunch of, uh, like I said, just some Tolex rips and things here and there just to Enough really to let you know that it's, you know, been on the road or been jammed a lot, been worn. You know, not enough to tell you that it's abuse or anything like that. Uh, I did notice that the handle is a little bit loose, so uh, a reminder to self, I think I'm going to tighten that, those up when I get in there. But yeah, let's uh, flip this thing around and see what kind of thing we've gotten ourselves into here. All right, so here's the rear. Uh, we do have a couple of fuses. One of them is for the high tension and one of them is for the mains. So in other words, the high tension will be on the secondary. That's, that's the B plus fuse. So it has its own thing. And then, uh, it, so that protects that winding. And then of course you got the mains fuse, which is on the, uh, the power cord on, the, on that side. You got the output selector switch, which is switchable with like, you know, a penny, or a, a, a tuppence piece or something like that. Tuppence. You have a couple of speaker outputs. You have also over here what looks like, I'm gonna have to read everything he said about this because he did mention that there were some mods done and I think this is a, an effects loop maybe. I could open this up and you could, you could find anything inside. It's gonna be a range of expectations from you know uh, really high quality uh, for somebody who did a great job and was a competent technician and then you could have uh, just a complete mess on your hands. Anytime you know that something's been worked on before, uh, you basically just cross your fingers. But let's pop the back door off and get a look at the tubes and stuff and then we'll pop the chassis. And we see some Siemens labeled EL34s. Uh, this has a date of 1971 on the test sheet. But as you can see here, um, massive transformers in these Marshalls. Big, big power transformer, just a massive output transformer, which uh, really, really helps with the bass frequencies and everything. You can't really skimp on an output transformer if you want an amp to sound really great. We have got all... Looks like original um, caps, or at least they're all matched, and I'm gonna be guessing that those are original. We got four cans back there, and we've got this can over here, which is a multi-section. This thing is gonna be really expensive to recap. If the customer wants to recap this thing, it's probably the best thing to do, recap it and do it properly. But it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna cost an arm and a leg to recap this. Because we've got another one over here. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, six cap cans. So yeah, we've got the Siemens output tubes, and they look like they've got a lot of hours on them. They're very, very dusty. I mean, look at the dust on them. This thing hasn't been really played in a long time. Like I said, I have to go back to the email uh, to our correspondence and figure out exactly what he said was going on with this because you know that this that I talked to him several amplifiers ago so it's like you know after a while one runs into another 
but you could see you can kind of see on the spacer in inside the the tube there you see how the spacer just has a really kind of a whitish consistency almost an ashy look to it you know that tells me that that tube probably has had a lot of hours on it plus it looks like up here around the crown you know obviously we have the flashing with the silver part that's not what I'm talking about but the area around that's kind of brownish I don't know if you can tell that or not uh, and you can really kind of tell it more on these it's kind of brownish grayish leading up to that and normally if it didn't have a lot of hours on these tubes it would just go you know from clear glass into opaque silver immediately it wouldn't be like this you know it wouldn't be like that so I think these have a lot of hours on them so I'm gonna look for those to probably have to be replaced also if you want this thing to be you know tip top this is a Sylvania 12x7 in V1 and it's it's got some hours on it you can see right there by the bottom you see the brownish ring around the bottom of that you know it's just been that's just got a lot of hours on it it's just a you know it's an old tube and it might still be fine um, but it's one of those things that you kind of notice when you're uh, getting into an amp like this, whether it's had a lot of hours, whether it's been really run a lot. The same story on this one. This is an older tube. You can tell by the patina on the pins and also, you know, obviously by the, just the ring around the base right there, the way that that's all discolored and everything, that the tube has been really run a lot. This is a GE... 12x7 on this one uh, it's rubbed off so I can't tell where it was made but once again we've got a tube with a lot of hours on it uh, this is one of those situations where I mean if he really wants to do this right and get this back up to tip top 100% uh, working condition ready for the next gig um, you know it's probably going to need a full retube and a full recap and uh, you know anything less and you're just going to be rolling the dice most likely on whether or not it'll survive the next gig just because I've had so many situations like that man you know I'll try to do my best to preserve what's there and save the customer money and a lot of times it works out really well but then you know a lot of times it doesn't so that it'll be a it'll be a crapshoot and I'll have to consult him to see how much he wants to spend on this but anything like this if it hasn't been uh, if it hasn't been serviced in a long time I mean look look forward to a pretty decent sized repair bill just in parts alone so let's go ahead and pull the chassis and look on the inside and see what we've gotten ourselves into uh internally just looking at the bottom of the amp in preparation for removing the uh chassis and you can see you know just what this thing has kind of been through somebody cared enough to uh to glue up a couple of these rips back down here so that the, it didn't tear up anymore so i mean it's been cared for but at the same time it's also been you know it's been uh, road worn We've got uh, a broken foot right there, so somebody dropped it kind of hard, probably on that foot. You can also see that the screws that uh, remove the chassis, they've seen a lot of screwdrivers in their day, so that tells me, you know, once again, everything points to this thing having been used, you know, it's just, uh, it's this is a road amplifier, man. This thing has probably seen a lot of bars, has seen a lot of rock shows, you know, might have seen a lot of exposed, <laughs> a lot of beers. <laughs> it's just seen a lot of living man this amp has been around the block so I, I definitely don't look for this to be any kind of uh, closet princess on the inside but um, I do think that once everything is said and done this is gonna be a kick-ass amp Ugh. sometimes chassis are like criminals they those come easy and sometimes they come hard so you know criminals was about the most pg rated thing i could think of okay so here's looking down from the top of the chassis here and you can see this thing was probably home to rodents at some point either that or it was or stuff was spilled you know somebody might have set their beer or set their coke on top of the amp at some point and uh spilled down inside the uh the heat exhaust grill on the top and then, you know, never got cleaned up and just got cooked on there and then caused a lot of, uh, a lot of corrosion. Just the general impression this thing has given me is that it's just been out of commission for a while. You know, maybe it was a backup amp or I don't know, maybe something happened a while back and, they, and he never got around to having it serviced. But you can see right there, 2 or 18 to 71, of course, 
you know, the Brits are always backwards. They drive on the wrong side of the road, and they also, uh, they also print their dates the wrong freaking way. <laughs> I don't know. So the 18th day, second month, 1971. Somebody, there's an Anne, there's a Sandra Anne. What's dit me? So I don't know. It's always interesting looking at these stamps. The great thing about having transformers that are so big, uh, they are usually they're bigger than the actual uh, tubes, so they kind of have a built-in built-in amp stand. There's a lot in here that's original. Looks like they painted the original solder joints on this. You can see the little touches of uh, like red paint right there. And I think probably what they were doing was during the uh, QC process, the person who was doing the QC had a little, uh, probably a marker or a little paintbrush, and they had to touch that red paint that they had inspected each and every single point in this thing, um, you know, or each of the points they were supposed to inspect. And the, where you see, you know, that that is gone, that's where it's, somebody's come back behind it and burnt it off. So everywhere you see that red, that's probably an original solder joint, so that hasn't been touched. We've got some loose solder balls right there, so it's, you know, definitely signs of somebody being in here other than a Marshall Tech. That right there is not, not an original solder joint. And we've got various components tacked onto that too. We've got a couple of what look like maybe new resistors, or no, no, maybe not. But see what I mean? There's some paint on those two. Those were inspected, that one was inspected that's factory that's factory that's factory see all those are factory down through there but that one on the end is not factory that big um, capacitor right there uh, looks like an original mustard capacitor that looks like an original resistor that right there is questionable and it's also a bit loose maybe or maybe not I mean, actually, that could be original as well, but it just wasn't marked for some reason. Because every component on it looks like an original style component. And also, the other end is, is still marked. So, I don't know. But you see what I mean about all of the uh, points where they inspected. I'll tell you what, there's a lot more in here that's original than not. I mean, even those um, a little electrolytics right there are original because you can see the inspection marks on those too. Original diodes, which are not are not crispy, they don't look cooked at all. So I don't I don't think there's a problem with that. Those uh, those resistors there, they don't look cooked either. You know they're not black like you might expect from something that was overcooked. Okay, see this is interesting now. See all these over here. This looks like the part that was modded. That right there is actually drilled into the... I mean, they have an extra one here. Why wouldn't they have used that instead of drilling way over here? Which gets you into the logo for the 100 watt. You can see the inspection markings are still on those jacks. Each one of those has a, the red inspection mark. So not really sure what's up with that, unless somebody was trying to mimic, you know, the inspection mark. Those do look a little bit redder than the ones that are over here. See what I mean? Those are a lot deeper red than those. So it's, it's quite possible somebody was just trying to mimic the look of an inspection mark when it's not an inspection mark. But why didn't they use that? You know, there's already a spot right there for... Maybe they didn't want to put it right over the top of that tube socket. That's probably why, because it would have been it would have gotten right up on that. Then again, they did it over here, so I don't know. See what I mean? Just strange. Uh, there's an unused plate here, also. Even those screws have little inspection marks on them. Look at that. Uh, we have an unused plate over here, probably for a model that had tremolo, I'm guessing. Maybe reverb. But yeah, um, like I said, it just looks like a lot of original stuff here. And I think our best bet for what we want to do, first of all, is go back to the original correspondence, figure out what the complaint was, and then we'll go from there. 
Actually, it's funny how that works. Uh, as soon as you turn the camera off, you get a little closer look when you're not looking through the camera lens, you know? And you start noticing things you didn't really notice with the camera on. But, uh, you know, right here you can clearly see one of these screen resistors has already been replaced at some point in the past. It's replaced with the correct type, but you can see it's clearly different than the other three. Um, this one has got some chipping on the outside, but that's just cosmetic. That shouldn't, shouldn't bother anything. Got some black tape right there on one of the wires. I'm not sure what that's about. Something definitely was spliced at some point. And that's going to the switch. So, or the, you know, that's the output switch. Also, I, I noticed that all four of these jacks on the back are hooked together. And this one on the end looks like it was added later for some reason. And all these look like they're the same type of jack. And they look like they might be the same manufacturer of jack as well. But... Uh, because that's the same type that's used over here on the inputs. So that, for some reason, was added by somebody, and I don't know, I can't imagine why on earth you would need five output jacks, you know, unless you were running like five different 112 cabinets or something maybe you know, I don't have, I don't even know. Just seems a bit silly to me why, you know, especially why you would modify the amp to include a fifth one. It looks like you already had four, but then why make a fifth one? It doesn't make any sense. It is quite a three-pipe problem. Anyway, so there's that. Oh yeah, one other thing I did notice too, uh, before I even got the chassis out, was that um, all three of these switches are different. There may be one original one here, and it's probably, probably this polarity switch, because that would be the least used. So that one's probably original, and these two were replaced, but you can see somebody actually went to great pains to scratch the hell out of the chassis when they were getting them out. Okay, so the ant belongs to a fellow named John, and John has this to say about it. He says, uh, my name is John. <laughs> Shazam! I was wondering if you could take a look at one of my Marshall Super Leads. So he's got more than just the one. It was made in 1971. Fantastic shape, but it's quit working. The fuses have not blown, and I cannot determine where the problem is. The pilot light burned out a couple years ago, but other than that, I'm clueless. I was using it at a sound check, and it quit working. Upon inspection, no fuses were blown, and prior to the amp's failure, it sounded fine. No buzzes or pops. I don't know if you've gotten to it yet, but I wanted to let you know that the red pilot light on the faceplate's burned out. So if you power it on, the light won't come on. It just failed completely without a fuse blowing. So he's saying that when he tries to turn it on, that nothing is happening. Uh, and you know, the first thing I'm thinking whenever I read that is that switch right there. That power switch. Already, right off the bat, it feels a little bit loose. So it would not surprise me a single bit if that right there were at fault somehow. That's definitely the cheapest feeling one of the three. Like that one's a nice carling one. Uh, I think that one is too. That's a nice switch. That one right there is kind of cheapo. And plus it's just not in there very well. Yep, it could very well be the switch because usually if you have a problem like that where you just get nothing, it's, e it's one of two things. It's either that transformer or that switch and that's definitely the cheaper of the two problems. So let's cross our fingers and pray to God it's that switch and not the transformer. And we should be able to figure that out relatively quickly. Now, for, first thing I want to know is what's the switch doing? So we have our leads hooked up to each side of the switch. A switch is basically just a shorting device. So it, it's a, an on-off switch just shorts it or, uh, or opens the, the connection. So we want to make sure we've got good connection first of all. So I'll just kind of scrape off any kind of patina that might be there so we get a good connection. Okay, so right now we're showing, uh, we're showing that the two leads are open. So it's, it's off. Now, if we switch the switch, it should have turned on. We should have gotten some kind of resistance, like a very low resistance, like almost nothing resistance. But that's the problem. We're, I switched it several times now. Well, there, see, something happened. Now, there's a somewhat low resistance. 8 ohms, 10 ohms. Uh, but look, I can, I can actually wiggle this switch in and out. And I can cause it to kind of change resistance. Right now it's gone way down. Okay, so that's 
off. That's on. It's starting to work now a little bit better so that the, I've actually cleaned the contacts apparently by just switching it a couple times. But the problem is it's not reliable. And also in my experience when a switch starts to do this, when it starts to get this intermittent thing, um, you, you're just you're asking for trouble. Um, and you're actually asking possibly to even be shocked or electrocuted by that switch because it could be any number of things going on inside the switch itself. So I'm not going to screw around with it. I'm going to replace that switch. It's not a big deal. I'll replace it with a better one that you know matches those large ones better anyway, hopefully. And uh, yeah, that that should at least take care of the you know the whole it not coming on and off thing. Now, if he wants me to to do work on this, it could use some. If I'm recommending something to this guy, I'm going to recommend a, 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 you know, the full deal because why not? I'm already in here. He's already going to be out some money for me lo even looking at it. So I could go ahead and replace all these uh, capacitor cans. It's going to be expensive. Um, also, that pilot light, which is no big deal. Also, I mean, again, power t the, the tubes, all the tubes really, um, every one of them look like they've, they're pretty old and have been cooked. Anyway, we're going to have a discussion about it, he and I, and we'll, I'll come back and we'll see what he wants to do and how far in depth he wants to go with this. At least I think I've figured out what the problem is. Now I'm going to confirm that right now, so we may as well go ahead and do that before we get him on the phone, but I'm fairly certain um, that that is the case. We'll check the voltage here as, it come, as, we, as we dial it up. All right, let's dial it up just a little bit and see what we get. Hmm, indeed. Okay, so what's going on there? Okay, I'm going to put it on AC. Let's back it down just a little bit over here. And we will come off of the... We'll come from the fuse. Okay, so we've got 33 volts coming in right there. So it is making its way. It's making its way through the transformer. So the transformer primary is continuous. Once again, let's let's kill this one more time because I want to make sure that this switch hasn't screwed up on us again. Okay, so that's yeah, that's low. Okay, just starting from basics here, we can check this fuse. And that's the mains fuse right there. And it's it's good. Right here we can just do this actually and check both the fuse and the transformer winding. And then we have a we have a fuse for the high tension. Now the high tension fuse is blown. Okay. So, a couple things. Our uh, switch was unreliable. Um, the one that's on the front—it's working now, pretty reliably. It's like I can hook up, I can hook up a couple leads. At first, it wasn't working at all, but now it pretty it works pretty much every time. The only problem is, as I touch it, you see there, the resistance gets bigger and smaller depending on what I do with it. That's obviously not what you want in a switch. It's just look at all the play in the switch, and just ignore this. Because that right there needs to be tightened down anyway. But look at this. So look at all the play in this thing. That's just an awful switch. See, these don't really have that much play. That one has almost none. And also, uh, replace that high tension fuse. And we'll see where that gets us. And then we'll call the customer and see if he wants to go further with it. And really do the job right. Okay, we're going to call John. Hello? Hey, is this John? Hey, Brad, what's up? Hey, not a lot, man. I've got your uh, Marshall up here on the bench. and uh... Okay, guys. Well, that's going to just about do it for this first part of this 1971 Marshall Super Lead uh, overhaul. Hope you guys have enjoyed the first part. Stick around. Uh, subscribe to the channel and everything to make sure that you get to see part two, which should be coming up shortly. So, yeah, until then, we'll see you all later.